I'm so sorry about the delay. <laughs> I had to run out and close the trunk of my car. You see, my car has a mind of its own, and it'll randomly open up the trunk whenever it feels like it. Of course, when I want it to open, it won't. Last week, I was grocery shopping, and I had my hands full with crates full of water. But luckily for me, my car has a sensor underneath the trunk. So there I was in the parking lot, hands full with crates of water, shaking my legs, trying to get the thing to open. And after what felt like a full Pilates workout, <laughs> it still didn't open. <laughs> and you see, since then, I've been asking myself the question, did the people who built this car really think this is what I wanted? That I dreamed of owning a car whose trunk would not open? Did they think the one thing that was missing in my life was that I needed a touch screen to turn the air conditioning on? Did they think the one thing that I was dying to tell everyone about was how I can change the temperature from a very chilly 21.5 degrees to a toasty 22? Whatever happened to making cars that just work? Or to the product managers in the room, how do we achieve that elusive product market fit? That phenomena when a product solves a real problem and takes off on its own. I'm Maria Jandwe. I'm a senior product manager for e-mobility services at Bosch. I've built everything from mobile apps that have had thousands of daily active users within weeks of launch to services that have had a penetration rate of over 90% across European markets. And this evening, I want to share three principles with you so that we can achieve better product market fit. Firstly, to quantify our assumptions. Secondly, to execute effective experiments. And lastly, to speak about the rate of learning with our senior management. But before I talk to you about my first principle, let me tell you a small story. Indulge me. A few years ago, I was working on an IoT platform. And without going into too many of the technical details, it worked on the premise that this one box received instructions and sent them to another box wirelessly. But something in all of this wasn't working. And three weeks before the start of production, I was told, Frau Janjua, go fix it. <laughs> so I got all the experts in the room, and we started troubleshooting, trying to figure out where this problem was. But the engineers, they were hell-bent. It's not on the wireless. It's anything but the wireless. So to avoid the situation turning into an internet meme, we got a cable and plug the two boxes together. And bada bing, bada boom, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> now you see, at this point, we were two weeks away from production, which meant we had two weeks to find a supplier who would deliver this cable. And if you've never been in this situation, think of it like going holiday shopping, when you have a really long list of things you gotta buy, but you're doing this on Christmas Eve, 30 minutes before the stores are closing. <laughs> yeah, we eventually did find a supplier who delivered this ridiculously long cable, but it was the most expensive solution in the market. And whatever profits we had were decimated. No profits left. And this brings me neatly onto the first principle that I want to share with you, to quantify our assumptions. And there's one sentence that I want you to remember, and really pay attention now because there'll be a test soon, and the sentence is, how, do you, how confident do you feel in your assumptions? And I want you to say it with me so that it goes in. 
So repeat after me. How confident are you in your assumptions? One more time. How confident are you in your assumptions? Let me do it one more time just for good luck. How confident are you in your assumptions? What you want to do is you want to get your team to agree on one number. There'll be a debate, and that debate is key. It gets all of those hidden and unknown dependencies out into the open. And the sooner that we can quantify our assumptions, the sooner we can separate fact from fiction and build confidence and create better options for us and our teams. Now, this brings me neatly on to the second principle, which is where you're left asking the question, really, how do you become more confident? In our industry, there's this unwritten rule that in order to be confident, we have to hire external consultants. And the bigger and more expensive, the better they are. Now, we all know the slides that they make. They're super pretty, but the stuff on those slides isn't always so pretty in real life. And the worst thing is, the knowledge just goes away the day they're gone. On the other hand, if we trust our internal experts too much, we forget that we are not the user. But what if I told you there was a way to strike the balance, a way to beat the bias, but at the same time keep all of those learnings in-house? Sounds good, right? Experimentation. And I'm not talking rocket science. I just mean testing a bunch of experiments or te testing a bunch of options before hitting series production. And there's one sentence you got to remember, and I credit Annie Duke, the author of Thinking in Bets, for this. If I am or am not, in a given state, by a given point in time, I will quit. So you know the drill. We're going to repeat this. So you're going to say it with me. If I am or am not, in a given state, by a given time, I will quit. We do it one more time so it's gone in. If I am or am not, in a given state, by a given point in time, I will quit. One more time for good measure. <laughs> if I am or am not, in a given state, by a given time, I will quit. Well done. Let me give you an example of how to put this into practice. Earlier this year, I took over a global product with one big problem. We spend too many hours in customer support every month. So we as a team had a hypothesis that by building a frequently asked questions guide, we'd reduce the number of hours by 50%. And we gave ourselves about three months to do this. So what do you think happened after three months? 0%, 10%, 20%, 30%, 60%? 14%. 14, that's a very precise number. <laughs> no, actually, we had zero. Absolutely no change. So we stopped. And we tried the next set of options. And you see, it might have worked for your business, or yours, or yours, but it didn't work for mine. And this is why it's so important to execute effective experiments. Because the sooner you can execute these experiments, the sooner you can figure out what is going on in your organization, what works for your organization. And as Stephen Levitt, author of Thinking Like Freak, writes, and I quote, our resources are limited. In order to solve tomorrow's problems, we need to give up today's duds, unquote. Now, this brings me on to the next principle I want to share with you. You see, our job as product managers is to learn. As Melissa Perry writes in her book, Avoiding the Bill Trap, our job as product managers is to reduce the space around the unknown. Now, of course, many of our senior leaders, they forget this. 
and they see failed experiments as a waste of time, a waste of resources, losses instead of profits. But if our job is to learn, we can't ever really fail, right? Of course, when your management is saying things like, show me the money, or asking you, when will I see results? This doesn't really help. A few weeks ago, I had to go and explain to my management that after four experiments, we still haven't found a solution for our customer support topic. And I was met with a very nice question. Yes, Maria, if it works for company Z, why is it not working for us? And as much as you want to say, yeah, but we're not company Z, it's not very helpful. Instead, I want you to remember one sentence. You know the drill, so pay attention, yeah? <laughs> how do we improve our rate of learning? So say it with me. How do we improve our rate of learning? One more time. How do we improve our rate of learning? When we talk about the rate of learning, we're talking about how quickly we can execute effective experiments. And the more of these experiments we can run, the sooner we can discover systemic issues that are lying deep in our organizations. And the sooner we bring transparency to these issues, the sooner senior management can actually work to resolve them. This could be everything from bottlenecks in the engineering release train, or staffing issues, or legal constraints. But when senior management is working on these issues, it clears the path for us to actually bring products out into the world. And so senior management become an ally working with you instead of against you. So to sum it up, there are three sentences you've got to remember. And we're going to test you now to make sure that you remember them. So the first sentence was, how confident are you in your assumptions? And you want to do this so that you create better options. The second sentence was a bit more tricky, but if I am or am not in a given state, by a given point in time, I will quit. And you want to do that so that you can execute better experiments. And the last sentence was, how do we improve our rate of learning? And you want to do this so that senior management is working with you instead of against you. And you see, when all of us apply these three principles, that's how we get to creating better product market fit. That's how we get to making cars that we all love. Cars that make us really enjoy driving, that make that journey magical, from, or the journey from A to B magical. And I'm hoping that we're going to be able to make cars whose trunks don't just randomly open. That, ladies and gentlemen, that is The Untold. Good evening. Woo!